Ms. Tokola, thank you for joining us today. And I'm just going to jump right in, starting with the current news. What is your, uh, your make on the uh, North Korea's participation in the Pyeongchang Olympics? Do you think this is just another cynical move on behalf of the North Korean regime? I think it's cynical, but I also think it's harmless. There's no reason not to do it. There's logic for both sides. Uh, the North Koreans like to be part of the international community. Just having a big party just south of their border to which they weren't invited would look bad for them. So they want to be there. They could also invite five to 600 uh, full-time, uh, full-paid guests to the Olympics. So it's a paid vacation for a lot of Kim Jong-un loyalists. It's very nice for them. For the South Korean side, they have some guarantee the North Koreans won't try to disrupt or embarrass the Olympics because North Koreans are there. And for some in the South Korean government who'd like to engage more, it's, a, it's an opening, it's a chance they can try it. I don't think it'll lead to much. I predict after the Olympics, we'll be back to the same cycle of testing and sanctions and diplomacy. But for now, it's fine. So, okay, so with the North Korean involvement in the Pyeongchang Olympics, how do you think the South Korean populace views this? That's really interesting because I expected some of the um, older conservatives would be unhappy with it and would protest. But it seems like the general public doesn't like it much either. There's a poll this morning that showed that 70% of the South Korean public does not like the fact that some South Korean athletes are having to make room for North Koreans. A lot of South Koreans don't like the unified flag. They'd much rather be marching under their own flag at their home Olympics. So this may not be that popular among South Koreans. Mark, what is your sense on our administration's North Korean policy? Do you, uh, how does it depart from its predecessors? I think there is a change. Uh, things are not what they were. In the past, I think policy was based on the idea that North Korea would at some point collapse. And if you could just keep them from developing their nuclear arsenal long enough, that would happen. I think the idea now is that's unlikely. Uh, they're gonna finish their nuclear arsenal before they collapse and therefore some change of policy is required. So I think maximum pressure, trying to force North Korea to the table, is something new. And I think the Trump administration has been quite concerned about making sure that countries enforce the UN sanctions and their allies stand together against North Korea. So it's not what it was. And whether that's because uh, the Trump administration sees it differently or just situations changed, and even if there was a Clinton administration, they'd also be applying more pressure now. It's, it's hard to say. It doesn't matter. But there's much more pressure happening now. So let's move on to sanctions. Sanctions have been a part of really international policy towards North Korea. They don't seem to have been very effective, but do you think that they're working now? Well, the sanctions regime has changed a lot. The sanctions are in place now are not the ones a few years ago. Initially, the sanctions were designed for two purposes. One was to slow down the weapons development program to deprive them of technology they needed. And second, to punish the elites by cutting down on luxuries. That's not true anymore. The sanctions now are aimed at the North Korean economy. So under new sanctions, 80 to 90% of what they used to sell to earn hard currency is now banned. So these are very tough and I think effective sanctions. But it may take time for them to work. And the question is whether there's enough time to let the sanctions have their desired effect or if something else has to be done before that. So continuing the sanctions theme, um, do you think that, what do you think of the reports that China has not been um, enforcing the UN sanctions and also Russia's involvement considering sanctions. What are your views on that? I think it's a mixed record. I think China is enforcing some of the sanctions. We've seen images of North Korean trucks being turned back at the Chinese border. We know there's much less uh, Chinese exports going to North Korea. We know there's a lot less trade from North Korea into China. So China's done a lot on sanctions. Uh, is there some cheating going on? There is. Um, whether it's uh, directed by the state of China or whether it's independent Chinese actors who are finding ways to evade the sanctions to make money is not clear. But there is some cheating around the edges, clearly. I think the approach to take with China is to help them enforce their own law. I think rather than finger pointing towards China and saying that we know you're cheating, the best thing to do would be to say, you're probably not aware of this, but we, we're seeing some trade going on. Would you like us to help you with the problem of trying to enforce the sanctions? I think that may, might be a constructive approach. The problem is that China is prepared to enforce sanctions to punish North Korea, they're prepared to enforce them to try to nudge North Korea. I don't think that China's prepared to have sanctions topple the regime. And I think their calculation will always be trying to fall a little bit short of that. Uh, the, what possibilities they might miscalculate. It may be that sanctions that China thinks are tough enough to punish, but not enough to topple, could end up toppling. So China's trying to calibrate what it does. So with Moon Jae-in as president of South Korea and he's left of center, how do you 
think that that affects policy? Is it going to impede our cooperation um, with a U.S., South Korea, and North Korea policy? I think there was some concern when Moon Jae-in was elected because we've dealt with a conservative government in Seoul for a long time under Lee Myung-bak and then Park Geun-hye. So this is a departure in South Korean politics. But I don't think that Moon Jae-in is like the former progressive used to be. Um, he's a very practical man. Uh, he's very realistic. And so far, the cooperation has been very good. Uh, Moon Jae-in initially uh, extended the hand out to North Korea, which they rejected. But he also refused North Korea's offer to uh, suspend testing if military exercises were prevented. So Moon Jae-in said just what we would have said. He said that the military exercises are perfectly lawful and necessary. Uh, North Korea's activities are unlawful and illegal, and they should stop them. So they shouldn't be equated. It was a very good answer. So I think with Moon, we'll have a good relationship. It's interesting to see that the South Korean public actually believes that the Trump-Moon summit was more productive than the obama Park and hay summit from before. So there's, some, there's some goodwill there, and I think the, North, the Koreans are impressed. This administration's taking the North Korean problem very seriously. For reunification, there's been a big push by the international community. Um, we hear that South Koreans want reunification. North Koreans, well, that's a different story. But how do you view unification? Should we be pushing for reunification? Uh, for a one Korea policy, or should we let the Koreans themselves figure out how they want to how they want to handle the situation? Yeah, well, the U.S. has supported unification uh, historically uh, for good reasons. It's because that's what both South and North Koreans say they want. It's in both constitutions. Uh, both North and South Korea agree there should be unification at some point. Uh, we agree the division of the peninsula is artificial, so it's not for the U.S. to push them. All we're doing is trying to uh, let them do what they say they want to do anyway. The question is how it happens. Um, we believe the unification should take place on South Korea's terms. Uh, Pyongyang clearly believes unification should take place on their terms to create a socialist Korea. So how you go about it is a little, is a little bit tough. Uh, the South Korean polling these days shows the South Korean public says they're less interested in unification than they used to be because of the expense. Uh, I'm not sure those polls mean very much because when unification happens, it's not going to be because they chose it to. It's going to happen on its own terms. If you look at Germany, West Germans felt the same way. For them, East Germany was a foreign country with people who were different from they were. They weren't that interested. But once it started, once a process began, they changed their minds very quickly in terms of saying, this is our country. These are our countrymen we need to unify with. For South Korea, those polls today will change very quickly. If there's a collapse in the North and there's a movement of North Koreans towards the border, the South Korean public will see as being a challenge they cannot avoid. This is their people. It won't be like steering a course with a ship. It'll be like shooting the rapids. When it happens, it'll happen in its own terms, and I think South Koreans will rise the challenge. Well, based on your economic um, expertise, how do you view the cost of reunification? How is it going to impact the international community and the, the primary players in um, the Korean Peninsula? Uh, it depends what kind of unification we're talking about. If it's a peaceful, slow merger of North and South Korea on South Korea's terms, then it's certainly manageable. Well, the South Korean economy is gigantic. It's $1.4 trillion a year. The economy of North Korea is about $40 billion a year, even including black market. The size of the North Korean economy is the same as the size of Des Moines, Iowa. Not to slight Des Moines, but it's not a big economy. So you're starting there with a very small basis, but next to a large country that's well capable of dealing with it gradually. If it's a collapse scenario, we're talking about dealing with chaotic North Korea, then it's going to be very expensive and very difficult to manage. In that case, I don't think South Korea will be able to handle it alone. I'm not sure the U.S. and South Korea can handle it together. We actually would need the international community to be involved in trying to deal chaos in the North. It's not just economic expense. It's all the things you have to provide. Security, infrastructure, humanitarian. It's a daunting project that we actually should be thinking through. In terms of long-term benefits, uh, North and South Korea united would be a powerhouse economy. South Korea's got an aging population. They could use the influx of actually very skilled, literate workers. North Korean education system is not bad. Uh, when they work in the Kaesong complex, which is run by South Koreans, we saw the North Korean workforce is quite skilled. And they'd have access to minerals, which they don't have in South Korea now. And they'd have a border with China that'd be a free open border. So shipping goods through Russia, China, into all of Korea, having Korea have access to the European markets, to its land links, it'd be a boom for South Korea or the new unified Korea. So, um, based on our experiences in Iraq, how would you envision the Department of State and the Department of Defense working together to resolve the North Korean question? Well, they have to work together. 
And my experience was in Bosnia. I was there for two years, and I was in Baghdad for a year. And in both cases, the State Department and the Defense Department, uniformed services, work together really well. They bring different skill sets to the table. They're both necessary. And I think they make a very effective partnership. One difference between Bosnia and Iraq was that in Bosnia, it wasn't just the whole of U.S. government approach. In Bosnia, the international community involved. We had the UN, we had the OECD, we had the European Union, and all of them brought skills that we, even as a whole government approach, we didn't have. Um, so Bosnia was better that way, it was more international. In Iraq, it was a whole of government approach, but it was a whole of U.S. government approach. So state and defense worked together very well. I worked for Ryan Crocker then, and the crocker General Petraeus partnership was a model of how you can do this. But we didn't have that much international participation. Some allies were there, but not those big organizations, not the UN agencies, not the EU. And if they were there for us in Korea, it would go much more smoothly. Fortunately, we have a UN command structure now that's in place. This is a UN operation. So having the UN sending states involved in the dealing with, with North Korea is really important. You saw that the Vancouver summit we just had, which is a summit of the, EU, of the UN sending states. Do you have any further thoughts on the North Korean situation that we didn't cover? Um, two big ones, I guess. One is that we need to make sure the U.S. ROK alliance stays strong. That's really important. I think there will be no solution in North Korea unless the U.S. and South Korea work together very closely and see things the same way. So constant communication, no surprises by their side, is really key. Remember, Kauri is an important ally even without the North Korean threat. We have to have a good relationship with South Korea even after this is resolved. So we need to watch that alliance and watch that relationship. Second thought is uh, China's role. And I think that the Korean Peninsula needs to be seen as part of a bigger contest between the U.S. and China. Uh, China sees Korea as being part of its natural sphere of influence. The U.S. is opposed to that. We think countries should be free to ally with whoever they choose. We oppose regional spheres of influence. So China's got its goals for Korea, which are different from our goals. We want an independent, free, sovereign Korean Peninsula. So the Chinese want a Korea within their sphere of influence. What we need to do is find a way to work with China to put that long-term strategic struggle aside for the time being and cooperate on dealing with North Korea. If we can't do that, it's going to be very hard to solve. Well, thank you, sir. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, sir.